A very good morning to everyone. Now, I just want to make a very quick announcement before we light our first Christmas candle. Um, yeah, some of you thought I would not be here this morning because they think I'm uh, in Singapore. Okay, this is why I don't want to tell you. <laughs> I'm not here, you don't come. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything next time. And then you get confused, okay? So, look, whether I'm here or not, church goes on. It really does. Is there Sunday school? Yes. Is there going to be worship? Yes. Okay? So, um, one day you say, hey, where, where did he go? Not telling. <laughs> because when I, when I tell you, you don't come. That really uh, just, uh, and then, and then you're here, then you, you say, oh, what are you doing here? <laughs> we thought you were in Singapore, right? Uh, I, I will be going to Singapore uh, today, and uh, after the worship is over, after the Bible reading, there is Bible reading club, by the way, <laughs> okay? After that, then I go off to the airport, and there will be a conference for the, for the young people. There's about 90 young people there. And so we're just looking forward to sharing with them the, you know, what salvation is all about, help them to find salvation in Christ. And that's always a wonderful challenge to look forward to. Okay, um, is there going to be Sunday school next Sunday? Yes, there will be. Okay, so please be there. And then will there be worship? Yes, too. Will there, most important question you know, in your mind, you may not want to say, is there going to be lunch? Yes, there is. All right, so please be here, and that would be wonderful. Okay, well, this morning is the first Advent we of Christmas. We call this the Christmas Advent. The word Advent comes from the Latin. The word is the idea of the coming. We celebrate the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ at Christmas. And so we, you know, the, uh, four Sundays to Christmas, and we have four candles. And each one represents to us what Christmas is all about. And it's so good to look at all these things. I mean, they are wonderful. You know, the, the decorations that we see, um, you know, each part tells a Christmas story. There's a story about these beautiful flowers uh, that we know them as the Poncieta. They, in Mexico, they're called the flower of the holy night. The story was told of a little girl that wanted to bring a gift to the Lord you know, went to church and wanted to bring on Christmas Eve a gift to uh, the baby Jesus in her heart, the Lord Jesus Christ. And there she was, and, you know, she didn't have anything else. And, you know, she put together a, a bouquet of, you know, they were not, as it were, uh, very colorful flowers. And that night, a very special miracle happened because of her love for the Lord, of her of her wanting to worship the Lord this way, the flowers bloom red, and the people called this the flower of the, well, the holy night. And it became the Christmas flower. Now, by the way, these are all made by our seniors. And on this Thursday, they all, see, it's all on the trees as well. And um, you know, they, they learn to do things like that, and they surprise what they can do, what they can create now. And, and we learn all this, right? And so we light the Christmas candle. The first candle we light, if we can have the lights off, it's, it's probably going to be best, right? We are reminded of what it means to live in a world where there are many challenges, and sometimes those challenges are not physical ones alone, right? You, you want to, is it possible to... Shut the curtain in that side because that, that window yeah, over that side. Not possible. Okay, jam that. Okay, because I can see the light coming across here. That, that's not. It, the remote there? No? Okay, all right. Never mind. <laughs> right? That, see, we don't realize that darkness can be so strong. Imagine no light. No light. And we're not talking physical light. We're talking about spiritual light. 
And nobody seems to be knowing what is happening. Where is that word of light that provides clarity for life? Where is it today? It's the same problem we face every time. Where is that light? This is what the scripture says. Though there was the psalmist who says, in your light, we see light. And this is who the Lord Jesus Christ is too. He is that word. He is that light. Combine the two together. That light is the light of life. And we all need that light to be able to see what life is all, really all about. And so every Christmas, we re remember the Lord Jesus by lighting the candle called the prophecy candle. That's the word of God. The word of prophecy reminds us that this is a word that brings light, that is able to help us understand the world we live in, that has helped us to understand life. Right? And so this becomes something very, very special that we treasure. And we thank God for, for His Word. And this is something that I'm very, very grateful for. This week, I received a phone call from, you know, this is a friend, actually, and he's an electrician that has helped the church a lot. And so he called up and he asked, Pastor Chris, can I ask you uh, a favor? I said, well, you've helped us a lot. Can I, what, what is it? He says, my mom just passed away. I don't know what to do. Can you help me? And I said, of course, let's, let's meet up. And to help another person is to bring that light. In a, in, in a time of grief, in a time of pain, in a time of, oh, what do I do? Well, that was the challenge. Can you offer a word of encouragement? Well, the Christmas week, this Christmas week, I will be doing a funeral. This is not for one of our church members. This is for a person who has helped the church a lot. Say, my mom is a Christian. She loves the Lord. She goes to a church that doesn't have a pastor. Now, we understand what that means too, because that's where Bethel began. We didn't always have pastors. We had guest speakers. And we are grateful for a time that we can have a pastoral ministry but we must share this light with others. Oh, we have Christmas tree, light. Share that light. A candle, the idea here is be that light wherever you are to help. No, that light doesn't come from ourselves. That light comes from the Lord. That light comes from His Word that we have come to appreciate and we share that light with others. This Christmas, let this be our challenge. Share that light. You have no idea the kind of hope and comfort you may bring to others too. Okay? Well, let's prepare our hearts for worship this morning.
Good morning, everyone. So I know that it says in the bulletin that it will be Ryan and I who will be here, but Ryan is unwell this morning, so it will just be me. But I feel very supported with our team here um, beside me. Um, so my name is Gloria, and this morning I would like to welcome you all in a time of worship. As we enter into this time of worship, let us open with a word of prayer. Our dearest Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for every opportunity that we can have to be in your midst, to worship you and to learn from your word. We thank you that we have songs of praise that can bring adoration to you, and we pray and ask that you would continue to fill us with your word um, as we hear the message later on. In Jesus' most precious and worthy name we pray, amen. So in preparing for this sharing, um, we were encouraged to focus on Christmas and the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. And given this week is Advent Sunday, we have just four more weeks until Christmas, and it's so special that we have these Advent candles to remind us what the focus is in this Christmas season. The prophecy candle, the first candle, reminds us of the coming of our Messiah King and how he was prophesied to Israel in the past and how he will come to bring light, hope, and salvation to the world. This is so special because God has revealed the coming of his son and that his son will be called Emmanuel, meaning God with us, so that we can personally have access to God through the Lord Jesus and through him, know the salvation plan of God that is being fulfilled. In Isaiah 7, verse 14, um, the prophecy of the coming Emmanuel reads, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. As we take time to remember the prophecies foretold of how God will send a ruler for his people, we remember of such hope in Christ that he came to be the presence of God with us. The first carol that we have chosen for today is O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And this sings of the anticipation of the coming Emmanuel and it's filled with joy and hope. The young people we have been studying from the chap um, Luke chapter two, um, uh, chapter one, sorry, and we've been studying in youth worship on the accounts of Zacharias and Elizabeth and Mary as they received special news of the births of John the Baptist and the Lord Jesus. And, you know, they found hope and joy that both of these children will be specially used for the salvation plan of God. As they received the news, they reflected over how God was their provider and protector for the people of Israel throughout all the years. And they found hope in the good news that um, the angel brought to them. Their response was in a form of special song that they wrote, and it's a song of praise to the Lord. The words of our first carol sings of the hope that can be found in the Son of God as a coming redeemer, that he has come to dispel the darkness and bring light and that he has come, that we may have faith and find joy and fulfillment in, of the fulfillment in the word of God. So may we rejoice that the Lord has come and there are no longer just prophecies of hope, but of reality. Um, as we take our first song together, I would like to also make it a little bit more enjoyable. So if the ladies could sing verse two and the men could sing verse three, that would be great. <laughs> So let's take our first song together. Captive in Israel, that 
beautiful singing. So as a church, our preparations have started a few weeks ago, and to gear up for the Christmas season, our seniors have kicked us off with the preparations in decorating the baubles that we see on the tree, and now the poncietta flowers as well. And they've also made Christmas wreaths that they can have at home. Um, you know, the choir ministry has also been preparing songs to sing on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day to add to our worship, even though we are not able to have a Christmas musical this year due to some COVID concerns. This does not kill our joy, and we um, are still filled with that hope to be able to share that news that the angels brought of peace to the world. And, you know, the young people have also had a special Christmas program, and a special dinner program last night to also um, remember the, the Christmas season. And they've also helped to set up all the beautiful decorations outside this morning. And we won't forget about the children's ministry who have been learning Christmas carols with the kids. And they've begun to teach them about the special symbols of Christmas, like the Christmas lights, the tree, and the star. You know, Ryan and I, we have just begun this journey as a family, and we are so thankful that the Lord reached out to us personally, that we may be able to discover his salvation plan for us. You know, we were both privileged to have parents who sought to bring us up to know the Lord. And as we prepare for the Christmas celebrations as a church, we are so grateful to have a community that our future children can also learn about the Lord and one day also hopefully be able to find that personal faith for themselves too. You know, this hope is something that we seek to hold fast to with one heart 
one mind and one spirit. As we know that we will soon face challenges in the near future where we will need to make decisions on how much effort and time we give to serve the Lord. As we celebrate our first Christmas together, as we remember God as uh, Jesus who came as Emmanuel, you know, we are reminded that as God was with his son to fulfill a greater purpose for his life, that he will also be with us as we seek to walk and serve him as a family. Our second carol for this morning is called Down From His Glory. And this is one of our favorite carols. It sings of the wonderful love of God that he has sent his son, who humbly was born in a manger, yet he had a tremendous purpose for his life. You know, it brings out the majesty and sovereignty of the Lord, who came down to earth to be our savior, to reveal and fulfill God's fullness of his plans. And the appropriate response, just like it sings in the chorus, is to come before him with love and adoration. So would you please rise as we take up our, um, this carol for today? And also just a warning that if you can hit the high note in the last verse, we do encourage you to try <laughs> so that it will make the song more beautiful. Thank you.
And thank you, Freeman, Daryl, and Audrey for the support. I would like to pass this time to Pastor Chris. Wow. Uh, how many of you reached a high note? <laughs> how many tried? <laughs> I didn't even try. <laughs> I didn't even try. You know, it's not going to happen. Well, I, I appreciate what Gloria shared, and more than that, it, the fact that she will continue to uh, be here this morning. Her husband is unwell, uh, at, at home resting, maybe uh, tuning in to see how the wife went. Right. And usually Ryan is the one that is fit, healthy, strong like anything. We have never known of Ryan ever falling sick. And usually it is the wife that is quite sickly. And today is the other way around. And the strong one is Gloria. And to me that is absolutely amazing to see. Well, I said to Gloria, you are practicing yeah, what you have made in your marriage vows in sickness and in health. Well, that's the challenge. You know, we, we, make, we make things, we know the vows, we know this word, we know that word, now keep it. Uh, not, not quite the same. Can we keep? The, do we really believe in the words we say we believe in? And if we do, what change will that bring to our life? And this morning's word to help us to understand salvation a bit better is the word change. Okay, well, let's think about this. We, we pray together. Our Father, we thank you for the scriptures to read that we may appreciate what salvation is really all about. We ask that you would help us to give our utmost to appreciate and understand this gift of salvation. And we ask that you would bless in Jesus' name. Amen. We turn to John chapter 6 this morning. And John chapter 6 is a very important chapter in, in the gospel especially. In fact, the whole gospel of John, the word faith, is mentioned almost 90 times. And yet, the word faith in itself, sometimes you see the word faith comes up, and these people believed. And if you look at it a little bit closer, John is trying to help the readers look at it. They're not believers. So is it possible for people who identify themselves as believers and not really true believers all the time? And John chapter 6, we begin to see this. There were people who appears to be seeking Jesus. They appeared to be seeking Jesus. They could say the right words. They could be there. They could be polite. But deep down, they were not real believers. And that is something that we must consider in our study of salvation. See, the one thing we want to end up with is not a mistaken idea of something as so important as salvation. Right? So we want to check it out very, very carefully. Now, John chapter 6, we read uh, over here. How do you know a person is truly saved? Seriously, how do you know a person is truly saved? I ask myself that question. How do I know I am saved? Well, I say I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? I come to church. I read the Bible. I listen to message. 
right? I do all the things the Christian is meant to do. We give, we serve. So how do I know for sure? Does that mean I'm saved? And when you read the Gospels, especially the Gospel of John carefully, you begin to realize it's not all those things. This is one thing. And that one thing is the word change. Have we changed? Have our lives changed? Have our pursuits changed? If we haven't changed, are we even we talk about being born again. We talk about uh, you know, having faith. How we truly, do we truly have faith? And you will begin to see this quite obviously over here in the conversation that the Lord Jesus Christ had with the people who came to seek Him. Right? Let's take a look at this in uh, verse 24, chapter 6, and we will see this. Right? In verse 24, when the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, and then, nor his disciples. Now, this was the multitude. They heard about the Lord Jesus. They've heard his teaching. They've eaten the bread that he is able to perform. All right, He's fed, fed them, the feeding of the 5,000 and more. And we read these words. Very carefully in verse 24. Seeking Jesus. That's what they were doing. They came to seek Jesus. Right? And so when people come and they said, I am seeking the Lord. And sometimes that sounds great. But what are you actually seeking the Lord for? That's the question. Right? Now let's take a look at that. And then they found him. Now, listen to what the Lord Jesus Christ says. Verse 26. And he answered them, and he just spoke to them very candidly, very honestly, basically straight, upright. And he said, let me tell you something. Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs. See, what is your... Let's ask ourselves, what is the reason we seek the Lord? What is your because? And I think we all know the because, you know, uh, uh, when, for students, they seek the Lord be, before exams. They will seek the Lord earnestly, Lord, you help me, you give me strength, let me pass, let me do well. And once they have accomplished that, they stop seeking the Lord. Right? If you're a person that is you know, looking for work, just come out of university, same thing. You're seeking the Lord. What are you seeking for? Lord, provide for me. Let me establish my business. Let me do this. Let me you know, bless me. What happens when that is fulfilled? Have you stopped seeking the Lord? For those who are battling health concerns, right? What are we seeking the Lord for? Lord, you give me strength. Lord, uh, you know, restore my health. You know, lots of, lot of times seeking Jesus. What are you seeking Jesus for? And the Lord knows. And the Lord yeah, tells them, you seek me, not because they have understood they have not understood the signs. They have not understood His Word. They have not understood the significance of what He wants to give to them. And that is salvation. What are they seeking the Lord for? Same thing today. This is the common search of men. At least three things, right? Blessings in life, physical health, material success. This is the common search of all men. And when it comes to the gift of salvation, it is often set aside and not even appreciated. And so we see the very same thing. People will come. They will seek. But the question is, what exactly are they looking for? 
And so the Lord Jesus Christ said to them, You seek me because you ate of the loaves, the bread, and were filled. And then he tells them, Do not labor for the food which perishes. These are temporal things. These are temporal blessings. If you want to seek the Lord to provide, will He provide? Yes, but they will perish. Right? I think we, we, we understand this, right? You eat, wow, this is good, filled, where do you go? You, you go further, you line up, and, and you, you look at, in Albany Highway, right? There's this new beef noodle place there, and you see the line there, it is crazy. I thought only Singapore has lines. And of course, all Asians. Right? You look at that, what are they seeking for? You, you can go there anytime, it's full. So Aldin and I said, let's, let's try it. Let's really see whether it's really that good. So we went and just before it opens, maybe nobody, and there's still a little line. And we tried it. I so disappointed, nothing. What, what is it exactly? Were we satisfied? Uh, not really. What is the catch? Unlimited noodles. <laughs> and there's a line there that is huge. They're lining up. Now, now is the shop next door. Their line shrank, you know. Is the Japanese, you know, somebody opened up a Japanese store. Next to them, they sell the katsu stuff. That's the line. Same, repeat. Now the line has transferred from here to the other side. You look at it, same. See, we, we, we read bread. See, we are not bread people, not interested. But noodles, yeah. <laughs> Japanese food, yeah. Right? You will be there. What are you seeking? So we, by the way, we went to, wanted to try the Japanese one. And then this, uh, we asked, very long line. How long? One hour. Bye. I'm not going to line up for one hour for uh, this, right? Crazy, but not that crazy. Look, look at the same thing. Look at the search, the same thing. And the Lord tells them, look, do not labor for food which perishes. You imagine you do everything, you, you, know, you go there early, where are you, yeah, find you. What are they actually seeking for? Lord, can you always provide this bread? This is very good bread you give. And it will be wonderful that you, you, know, you are my provider of bread all the time. And so the Lord tells them, look at this. Okay, don't it, look for these things here. But the food which endures to everlasting life. Are you interested? The things are, that are eternal, the things that are spiritual, and to most people, unfortunately, it's lost to them. Right? Look at this here. And he tells them, because the Son of God you know, is able to give you these things. What was the response? Now, look at the response over here. And the response was, okay, uh, you, you, well, you, you want to talk about uh, faith, you want to talk about spiritual, and so they began to talk to the Lord. Now, verse 28, they said to the Lord Jesus, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Now, oh, that becomes a real problem here. You see, why sometimes people seek, and then after a while, they just stop. Or they, they seek, but they just, you see, they, 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 uh, it just gets nowhere. There's no change in their life. They, they, just, you know, they just continue to want those things. And whatever the Lord offers them, it's lost to them. I tell you part of the problem, it's right here. We can have a very wrong belief, idea of belief in the Lord. And so the Lord Jesus Christ has to correct. So one of the problems that were there is about, okay, you, you talk about salvation, what must I do? Right? What are, what are the things that I can do to do the works of God that I can, uh, I can have these things? 
yeah, right, you want to give me this? Okay, what must I do? It's always, all the time. What must I do? And the Lord had to tell them, it's not about what are the works you must do. It's about believing. That is what you need to look at. Do we understand what it means to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? And they don't, frankly. Do you see their lives change? No. Right? They look like on the outside to be seeking Jesus. But they are not people who are interested in eternal life or anything that is spiritual. Look, look, let's take a look further. And the Lord had to uh, tell them, look, this is the work of God, that you believe in Him whom He sent. And then they responded, okay, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe in you? Same problem today. People look for signs. Show me a sign, God, that I may believe. Do a sign. Same problem. Right? One, they say, what works will I do? If I do this, do this, do this, do this, that means salvation. No. Faith. Okay, show me sign. Not sign. Now, let's take a look at this. It is the same thing. Right? And so they can even uh, say, look, our fathers ate the manna in the desert as it, it is written. Were they people who know a bit of Bible? Yes. The most dangerous people are only know a bit of Bible and you mix in your own stuff. You have a problem. And so they said, it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. This is called selective Bible reading. You like this verse. Wow, this verse is such a blessing to be. See, God give me food to eat and I memorize this one verse. And so the Lord had to tell them, I t let me, can I tell you something? Moses did not give you bread from heaven. My Father gives you the true bread from heaven. The bread of God it is He who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. This was the Lord Jesus' attempt to bring them back to what the truth is all about. See, this is a very real struggle for many people. One, the struggle of your own belief system. Two, you have your own ideas of what it means to believe. Three, you, you, know, you can read the scriptures and you can interpret it not, not quite correct. And so you have a combination like that. Do you find faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? And is the life changed? No. And that becomes a bit of a problem. Well, let's, let's see how the Lord Jesus Christ is wanting to help them. How did the Lord try to help them? One, He would gently correct them. Two, he will help them to refocus on what faith is. Now, let's, let's take a look at this. Okay? So he talks about the bread of life. You are looking for bread. Now, well, let me tell you, the bread you are looking for is not going to give you real, true life. A life that is wonderfully transformed by God. This bread comes from me. Now, let's take a look at what Jesus said. Verse 32, My Father gives you true bread from heaven. Right? Now, verse 33, it's called the bread of God that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Verse 35, I am the bread of life. Right? From the Father, who, who is this bread? I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. You've got to put the two together. One, you come to me. But do you be really believe in me? And so a lot of people come to the Lord Jesus Christ. But they don't really believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And what he is really saying. And that becomes a really big problem. Now, what was the response of it all? 
Now, the Lord had to uh, really help them to see this, to, to say it as it is. All right? Now, you look at them. They come, they are seeking, but the seeking equal they are people who are saved. Are they? Now, this is the reality of what they really are. And in verse 36, we read this. And the Lord said, I say to you, you have seen me. And this is your problem. You do not believe. Do you really believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, let's take a look at this. They have seen, they have heard, and yet it didn't result in faith. Now, here is another problem. Verse 41 to 43. And then the Jews complained about him. Now, the, remember the phrase, the Jews here, is not a reference, general reference to the Jewish people. This is not what it is. Today, we call the Jews people from Israel, they're Jewish people, right? That's a common reference. But in the Gospel of John, this phrase, the Jews, is really a reference to the religious uh, leaders of the land. These were the Pharisees, these were the scribes, these were people who are very steeped in Judaism. They are called the Jews, okay, just so we can understand this a little bit better. And they hold on to what their traditions, their faith system, whatever it is, and they, you know, whatever they hear inside them, they complain. They didn't really like what the Lord Jesus Christ is saying to them, right? And so uh, the Lord knew this and he said, look, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And then they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father, mother we know? How is it that he says, I have come down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered to them, look, don't murmur among yourselves. See, sometimes when people um, speak like that, in their heart, they already rejected the Lord. They, they don't, they're still there. They'll still come. They'll listen. But in their heart, they object. They don't, they don't really want to accept what is being said. Now, this was what it is, right? They mock at what was being taught. They scoff at who Jesus claims to be as the bread of heaven. Right? Now, we see this. There is those who, frankly, they don't really believe in the Lord. There are those who will actually complain about it. And inside their heart, they have rejected. Now, here's a third one. This is more subtle. This is more subtle, but it's there. In verse 60, we read, therefore, many of his disciples. Now, this is interesting. There are people who even call themselves or identify themselves as disciples of the Lord Jesus. And yet, their lives are not changed very much. Well, take a look. They heard this and they said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? Right? This is too hard. Why, why are we listening to this? Can't we take something else a bit easier to understand? And then we read, the Lord knew what they were saying, and He said to them, does this offend you? And then verse 66, very quietly, they said no more. They just left. They went back, and they walked with Him no more. Right? And that happens too, where after a while, people stop. Right? They, they can't get what they want. They can't get the blessing that they want. They can't get this. They can't get that. They just stop. This is subtle still, but rejection. Yeah, not interested. So you have one, two, three. Right? Now, the Lord Jesus goes on to explain. Then how do we know? How, what do we look for? What are the changes we look for? 
to know that these are, tr these are people who have real faith and are truly saved. Now, let's take a look at three things here. So we have three things. This is not real. They may be, say they are seeking, they may be even following, they may come to the Lord, but no real faith. They, they are not people, who, they will just object to everything that has been taught. And then after a while, they just drop out. Now, what are the an, another three things? How do we know that this is real faith? Let's take a look at what the Lord Jesus Christ taught here. In verse 44, chapter 6, 44, right? And this is what I look for. How did I know I'm really changed? Now, this is what I look for. In verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up at the last day. This is true salvation. What do I look for? I look for God truly working in my life, changing my heart, changing my desire. Am I drawn? I ask myself, what am I drawn to? So, I, I you know, look back, and in the past, I came to church, 18-year-old, I, I went to church, and I'm there seeking. But what was I drawn to? I knew what I was drawn to. I was drawn to the world. I was drawn to all the... Was I really drawn to spiritual things? Not really. Then I began to realize, actually, I must ask myself, am I even saved? Because the Lord Jesus Christ said, unless the Father draws a person to the Lord, you won't really come to Him. God has to draw us to the Lord. Is God really working in my heart? Am I drawn to the Lord? There is the difference. That was the one change that I needed to see. Am I drawn? Right? So, Bible study, are you drawn to come? No food, you know. Not like Sunday. Are you drawn? Church camps, are you drawn? And that would tell you what you're really drawn to. Well, I'm, I'm seeking the Lord, you know, that, that He will bless me, that He will give me this, He will give me that. Same as all the people right there. And after a while, do they really have faith? The Lord tells them, you don't have faith. You want to see true faith? You will be drawn to the Lord. So, let's take a look at this. No, right Now, verse 45, here is something else. It is written in the prophets. Now, this is what the scripture says. And they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to be. You want to see people who truly comes to the Lord? There are people who will learn. They hear the word of God, they recognize it. That's the word of the Lord. And they come. They hear and they learn. What's the point of hearing if you don't learn anything? Seriously. One whole year of learning doctrine. What do we know about the doctrine of God as Father? What do we know about the doctrine of God as the Son? What do we know? Holy Spirit, church, now, right, go on further. Salvation. We've heard a lot, but what have we learned? And we begin to realize, we hear, but we don't learn. When God is truly real in your life, you will actually hear and learn. And you will see the change happen. Right? Those who are at school, you know this. You can hear and learn nothing. But when you are learning, that's when you are progressing. That's when you're improving. That's where it becomes part of you. They heard these people will hear and learn, as it were, from the Father. Such people will come to Jesus. Right? So there are people coming to Jesus. They're seeking Him. They are even following Him. Call them whatever you want. You can call them believers. You can call them disciples. It doesn't matter. The real thing is, what's inside? Are they really drawn to the Lord? What have they learned? Over time, what have they learned? And have that learning transformed their life? 
Look at the, their complaining spirit. They haven't changed. Look at the remarks that they say. Look at all the things. They are still the same, chasing the things of the world. They haven't changed. And you begin to realize Jesus was right. They are not believers. Those who will come to me, they hear, they will learn from the Father. Now, that's the second point. The third one, verse 56. He tells them, He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Now, this of course needs to be explained. He is that bread of life. It's who he is. If we partake of him, all that he is, we embrace all that he is, what he stands for, what he has taught, we remain in him. These are the ones that are true believers. Right? And the word is abide. They will remain. So, am I still remained in my faith after 20 years? Yes. Do I see any changes? Yes. Compare me 20 years ago. If I am the same person, then I'm in trouble. And I don't mean I've got more white hair, okay? My hairdresser tells me, you've got a lot of white hair now. What do you want to do about it? <laughs> I say, nothing. <laughs> Let the white hair come. I have waited 43 years for it, you know. Please don't take it away. <laughs> What's wrong with that? I see the young people dye their hair white anyway. <laughs> and to them, it's cool. <laughs> right? So mine is El Natro. <laughs> right? You see, for me, the focus is why are these, these things will come? What is my change? You know what? I, my heart, my mind. What are all these things? They will perish. What is it worth? What are the things that are really valuable? What are the things that are truly worth living for? That is my one pursuit. Right? I, I shared uh, earlier that you know, Christmas, that week, I will be doing a funeral for a friend of us and the church. And, you know, reminded all over again, you can live 76 years of life. What is it worth at the end of the day? Now, this was a very wise woman. She loved the Lord, and she, she said, my mom, while she was alive, gave her house to the three sons, and she just all her assets got. I want you to have the inheritance now because that is not important. She lived the rest of her life just wanting to know the Lord as best she can. See the change? You see, my mom before, the, the sons were telling me, my mom before was not like that. But when she became a Christian, she was very forgiving. She forgave relatives that you know, there was a grudge there for the longest time. And my mom, very hard to forgive people, but she changed, and that was the key word. That's how you know. It's not a person in their deathbed, I, I, okay, I accept Jesus. You, you, wouldn't have, you wouldn't know anything. But the reality of it is the change that you see. That the Lord Jesus is precious to you. You just want to be with Him. You just want to abide in Him. And so the sons, of course, were very sad once in Japan, coming back. And so they, they, they said, well, I said, how, well, how did mom pass on? And he said, she, you know, usual, she's worked hard all her life. She's an accountant in Taiwan, but gave up that profession to give to the sons a better life. She was a cleaner in Perth, from an accountant to a cleaner. And she has worked hard all her life so that we could go to school and succeed. And what, how did you, you know, at the end of it, she did all that she did. She sat down, we saw on the CCTV, and then she closed her eyes. She struggled a bit and then she passed on. So I said, we all want to go like that, you know. And I said, to me, that is a very gracious way how the Lord would bring someone home. Right? You don't need to struggle and you've worked hard all your life. 
What did you live for? And they would say, you know, my mom never took a holiday. She didn't want to go for, but she didn't care. I said, look, you don't understand this. That generation is gone. It's a very special generation. They never lived for themselves. They lived for their children. That was my grandma's generation. They would tell, they would give us the drumstick and to eat. And they would take the wingtip and tell us, this is my favorite part. It's not a favorite part, there's no meat in it. And why they eat it? Out of love. They lived for others. That generation is gone. The generation today is the self generation. What's in it for me? What can you give me? Well, this is, this is very different. This is wonderful. This is faith too. And this is where you recognize this is faith. The kind of faith to see beyond the physical things. To recognize the value of what life really is. I am the bread of life, Jesus said. He who comes to me, he who partakes of me, eats of me, they will never thirst again. That is the thing that truly satisfies the soul. And when you see this, you begin to realize that person, this is a true believer. Right? And, and this morning, I want to encourage us all to take this word uh, to heart. Right? This is why the Lord Jesus Christ came in the first place. First, He gives of Himself. And two, the words that He speak about. Let's take a look. How does this actually work? In John 6, 63, and He says, The Spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing. The words I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. The word of the Lord, when you come to Him, you learn from Him, you abide in Him, what happens? You will see that life inside you change. There is a life force that comes from God. A desire for that which is spiritual. Understanding and wisdom to see the value of eternal things. This is was the change that I was looking for. And until I saw it, I sought it. And, 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 and being, until I see the reality in my own life, I would not be too sure whether I was saved at all. Well, we must check. Let these words encourage us to check uh, you know, what, we really, what we really believe in. Now, take a look at what the Lord Jesus Christ said to Peter, right? When the others left, and then the Lord will tell him, uh, tell him, do you also want to go? And then verse 68, Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. I want to come to a point where I'm not only changed, but I am very certain in what I believe in. Change, certain. I have come. You have the words of eternal life. Where shall I go? Right? You are truly the Son of the living God. This Christmas, let this be a challenge to all of us. Find salvation. Find the Lord. Come to Him, yes. What does He want to offer us? He wants to offer us life eternal. What does that life eternal look like? You watch, your heart, your mind, your spirit will be wonderfully changed. Can you have a faith that is certain? That you can speak about? And if people ask you, would you go away? And like Peter, you know, where do we want to go? The Lord has the words of eternal life. And we have come to believe. Can we able to speak of having such certain faith? May it be true. And if it is, that would be a wonderful Christmas uh, blessing indeed. Okay, well, let's think about this. Let's prepare our hearts this morning for communion.
going to ask those who are supporting and to come on over. We call this the Lord's Supper of Holy or Holy Communion. See, this is where the word communion comes, the idea of communion comes from. And that is the whole idea of abiding in the Lord. To a believer, that is, our, that is something that we treasure and it's special, that we can abide in the Lord. Uh, you know, each part represents what the Lord did for us. We cannot forget the sacrifice He made. The, his body, uh, the cup represents His blood. You know, he gave everything. How would I live my life if a person gave me everything? I'm glad the three sons turned out well. They tell, my mother gave us everything. She's worked hard all her life. What do we want to do with our life? They just, they're going to do whatever they can. The same thing, isn't it, for us? If this is who the Lord is to us, He's given us everything. How do we respond with our life? Well, one, would we not be drawn to Him? With every passing year, would you not draw near the Lord? Two, would you not learn further? Three, would you not abide in the Lord? One, two, three. These are the changes. Those are the real evidence of salvation. Well, let's look for them. And as we come to the Lord's table, let us renew that faith in the Lord all over again. Okay, we're going to sing a hymn together as we uh, have uh, this passed around. And that sings of the sacrifice that we must never forget. It was at the cross that the Lord gave His life. But this applies it to a present context. It was there when our eyes are open. It was there that we come alive to the Lord. Well, let's sing this together as we have this passed around. And did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for sinners such as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith. I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Was it for crimes that I have done, he groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond decree. the cross where I first saw the light 
take a moment to just peel open the first part where this wafer represents the bread the Lord Jesus Christ refers to as his body given to us and we are to do this in remembrance of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus for us well let's partake together prayerfully Our Father, we thank you for giving to us more than physical bread, but life eternal that we so badly need, as physical food is needed for life. We need that life that comes from your salvation. And we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ who laid down his life that we may have life eternal. But help us to respond. We know these truths. But help us to respond with faith, with understanding, with receiving the Lord and who He is into our life. And to do that until we see real changes occur too. We ask that you would hear this, our prayer. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, let's open the next part of the cup. Okay. Oh, this one is... Sorry, mine one didn't open. If anyone having difficulty there, you need any... any you're okay? Okay, I got one that didn't open up. <laughs> right. Well, the cup represents the life blood of the Lord given to us. And I brought a word to the young people yesterday about the shepherds. Sometimes, like the shepherds, we feel that we're not good enough. Not good enough to um, be able to do anything significant to, for God. That's not true. The focus is not how good enough we are. The focus has always been the Lord Jesus who can make all the difference in our life. The power of the blood that cleanses us, that sanctifies us, that gives us life anew, is what is represented in this cup as we partake of it. Let's partake prayerfully. Our Father, we thank you once again for the Lord and who He is. May these truths resonate in our heart deeply. May we receive them with faith too that we may see our heart and our mind more drawn to the Lord Jesus. We ask that you would hear this, our prayer, and bless. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, hang on to this, and then you can dispose of them in the bin outside. Well, let us respond with an offering for the Lord's work uh, this morning. Okay, I can ask those who are collecting the offering to come. Thank you. Yeah. We're going to sing one last Christmas carol for the worship service. And this is a very interesting uh, Christmas carol. It's world famous. It's been translated to many languages. But the story of how it came about has always been interesting. All right. 
Sometimes we, life don't work out as we plan it to be, and then things don't work out. And then, uh, you know, looking backward is always easier. It look, at, look at it, it worked out just as the Lord has planned for it. Uh, Paul wrote about all things will work together for the good for those who love the Lord. This is what faith is to keep on exercising it, to keep on abiding in it, to keep on you know, trusting in the Lord, and to see how things work out. Silent Night, Holy Night was actually written in Salzburg, in a little town there, in Austria. Uh, so the, the original version is not English. It's German. <laughs> right? And it was, the reason it was written was because the organ broke down. And so in those days, a lot of the hymns, many of the songs were actually composed for the organ to be played. And so the organ broke down, and it was Christmas Eve. What are they going to do? And so there this man was to say, well, I'm going to come up with a Christmas carol on Christmas Eve to be sung on Christmas Day that will not require the organ, but the guitar. And then born this song, Silent Night, Holy Night. And to me, that is absolutely amazing. So if the organ didn't break down, there will be no Silent Night, Holy Night, by the way. Right? So all things can work together. Is that true? When we trust the Lord, if we're going to remain in Him, we're going to continue, it will work out? Absolutely. And that, to me, has always been an uplifting thought, the word of the Lord. Okay, well, let's sing this together. Uh, let's rise as we sing one last Christmas carol as we remember the very special blessing the Lord gave to us. Salvation is found not in our works. It's not found in what we do, but entirely in the person of the Lord Jesus and what He did for us. May we hold firm, hold true, to that wonderful faith and see the changes that can take place in our own life that would reflect salvation. Let's sing this together. One, seven, four.
Let's pray together and ask that the Lord will bless us before we go from here. And now may this wonderful God of ours, who has given to us the precious gift of a Savior in the Lord Jesus Christ, that He would also draw us to the Lord, that He would help us to understand what we can learn from the Lord and to find living life in His words that would bring new life to our spirit all over again. We ask that the Spirit of God would encourage us, enlighten us, strengthen us to, to abide in the Lord Jesus and to discover the joy that is found in salvation afresh this Christmas. We ask for this blessing in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen.